Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Sometimes I wished I was just a little bit older so that I could have been one of the privileged few that Sister Ignatia helped get sober. And one quick comment about Bob's wife. She goes to every meeting with this man and is probably just as much of a help to us in Alcoholics Anonymous as he is. And I think he's stored one, what, five, six week meetings a week on a very regular basis. And Elma, would you please stand up and say hi to all of us? The next speaker I have, I had the opportunity to go to Minneapolis last year. And I listen to the old timers and they only got three minutes of peace out there to speak but I wrote down names and as I was listening to them speak I put stars next to their names because I knew that I would have the opportunity to do this this year and I remember that this young young lady had, had four stars next to her name when I got home and I didn't remember why until I talked to her on the phone again she was an inspiration to me then She's been an inspiration since she's got here just this afternoon. Ladies should go first. The person with the oldest sobriety should go last. But she's both, so I stuck her in the middle of two thorns. I mean, two beautiful young men. She's 93 years old. She got sober in 1945. And ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and she loves us young guys. That's right. <laughs> I like the fellas. <laughs> I'm safe. I'm safe. My name is Nancy, and I'm an alcoholic. And if I had been a good little girl, you wouldn't all be here. And I've been told to stand up straight so everyone could see me and talk loud enough that you could all hear me and then sit down fast (laughs) so you could all love me. I think I'll tell you a lot about myself <clears throat> before I went into AA so you can see the difference. I was uh, three years old when my mother died, and uh, I was about five when I knew if you didn't have a mother, you had nobody for you, and you better get going for yourself, because you had to do it. And my father married the third time. His second wife was nice, but sickly, and I liked her. But the third time, he married a woman, and she notified my sister and me. By the time she came back in two weeks from her honeymoon, we were to be out of the house. My sister was 17, and she had a boyfriend, and she got married. 
and she had 52 years with her husband. A very nice life. Well, I couldn't get married. 14. So I went to neighbors and I got a room. And they gave me a room for five dollars a week. And then I went to the telephone company. Is that better? I went to the telephone company because I always advertised in the paper for a job. And it was fourteen dollars a week. So I went down to the telephone company. I got the job. And uh, when I was leaving, they said, uh, now be sure and bring your birth certificate when you come. Oh, I said, I went home to the neighbor, my friend, and I said, they want my birth certificate. I said, I couldn't do that. I said, I said could I steal my sister's birth certificate? Would that work? She said, sure. <laughs> so I didn't know anywhere to go but the priest because they knew our records. So I went to the priest and I asked for my birth certificate telling him my name was Rose. And he said, uh, why, I, I just noticed that you got married. And I said, I know I did, but I said, I, he says, why, why do you want this birth certificate? I said, because I have a job. He says, and you just got married? And I said, yeah. Well, I left my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why? Well, the only thing I knew that men did was beat you. So I said, he beats me. <laughs> and he said, I think he knew the state I was in. But he gave me the, the birth certificate. And he said, now you come back here to confession. <laughs> I don't need to tell you I never did. <laughs> I was afraid if he got a hold of me, I didn't know what he'd do. So I went off to work. I worked in the telephone company, and I had a room, and I got $14 a week, so I had $9 spending money. And that was a lot of money. I can tell you, I felt rich. Well, I worked there for quite a few years, and then I learned that answering the telephone, anybody could come along and answer the phone, so you didn't have any regard at all. So I decided to, a friend of mine was a hairdresser, and I decided that if I were a hairdresser and had a lot of customers, I'd be making money and I'd have some power. And I sure needed power. So I went along, spent three years in the shop, and I got the license. This is before they had license, but I got a regard that I was, you know, ready to do hair for people. So I worked as a hairdresser for quite a few years. And then, as I went on, I got married, of course, and you can imagine, I was a big success in marriage. <laughs> My husband would say to me every time I'd go to the refrigerator to get another beer, he'd say, are you with the refrigerator again? <laughs> and I'd have to say, well, I really drank in a way that was terrible. And I was very unhappy married. But one time I went out by myself after working all day, and I was drinking martinis. Well, I don't know how many martinis. I remember three, but I don't remember how many more. And I went out on the street. I didn't usually drink in bars, especially by myself. But I fell down in the street, and I was picked up by the police. And they uh, took me to the hospital. They thought I was sick. And the hospital said, she's not sick, she's drunk. So I had to go back to the psychiatric ward. I got into the psychiatric ward and I, I didn't even know it, I slept. I got up in the morning and I said to the, whoever it was, I said, to, I said, if you just give me my clothes, I said, I have to be to work at nine o'clock. And she said, you can't get out of here. She says, unless somebody calls for you. 
you're not a responsible citizen. So I waited and waited, and of course, who could come for me but my husband? <laughs> the last person I wanted to come. Well, he came, and he said to me, well, you've disgraced yourself and me again. I said, yes, I didn't say And I had to go home with him. But I can tell you, I thought then that I'd never drink again. I really thought that I could control it, that I'd have to. I was so ashamed. Well, I left my husband, and I took nothing with me but my coffee pot. That's all I wanted was a lot of coffee. I got a furnished room. I stayed there for a few years, and I would be getting a job, and then I wouldn't show up, and I'd have to get another job, and then I'd get, she wouldn't show up, I'd get another job. But I just really ran out of being able to keep myself together. And finally, I, decided, I called up AA. I knew about AA eight years before I called them. And I called them up and I said to them, I had a problem drinking. And she said to me, uh, can you walk? And I thought, oh, they're so understanding. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, why did you ask me that? She said, well, if you couldn't walk, we would come and get you. Inside of me, I didn't tell her. You'll never come and get me. I'll go to you. Which I did. And when I got outside that building, I looked up at it, and I thought, thank goodness, there's a place for me to go that they know what's wrong with me. I got inside, and the woman said to me, are you the woman that just called? I said, yes, I am. She said, what is your name? Oh, I said, I'd rather not give you my name. <laughs> she said, I don't care if you don't have a name, just so you have a problem with drinking. So I knew I had to tell the truth to this lady. So I said, my name is Nancy. Well, I sat with her, and I went every day for five days. And I'd go upstairs, and they had a, they had a, a little place where we could go get coffee. And I'd go upstairs and get coffee. And I sat there shaking it out. There were no places to go like there are now, you know, we have and all that sort of thing. And for me, I think it was good. Because I never forgot those five days. And when I got home, I couldn't sleep. And I condemning myself. I said, you don't deserve to sleep. You don't Nobody was as mean as I was to myself. I was so ashamed. Well, finally, I got the message. And I couldn't believe that all they were ever going to say to me is, just don't take the first drink. I thought that couldn't be just a building guilt, just not taking the first drink. Couldn't be this big association, just not take it. But it was true, they never gave me anything else. But don't take the first fruit. Well, that worked for me. And I go to the clubhouse, and in those days, Bill Wilson was in the clubhouse with us. That was a long time ago. And I was fortunate enough to go to a banquet in Washington with he and Lois one time. And uh, thank goodness, Bill Wilson gave us what he gave us, which was our light and our hope. Well, I got inside, and there was a woman there that said, we have a meeting for women every Friday night at such and such an address. And it was very close to where I lived in New York City. And uh, I said, give me the address. 
And when I looked at the house, it was an old house. And uh, I didn't know that those old houses were most expensive. <laughs> so I went in and uh, I got to the meeting. And the woman that ran the meeting was not an alcoholic, but her husband was. And she was a literary agent and very interested in people. And uh, I went there every Friday night for 15 years with her. And what she taught me was, she said one night to somebody at the meeting, she says, wasn't it wonderful what Nancy did the other night? And I thought, what in the world did I do? I must have hospitalized somebody. This was the only thing that I knew how to do. And she said, uh, I, I didn't know. And I thought to myself, if that woman sees something good in me, maybe there is something. And you know, it gave me a feeling that I did have something inside of me. And maybe I should try and see what I could do. And from that day on, I understood what they said was, give up drinking, AA says give up drinking, and you can change your character. Well, I started from then on changing my character. I didn't even know what a character was, to tell you the truth. But it was to change myself into what I could be. Well, I had a job, of course. But I went to her one day, and I said to her, you know, I think I should speak better English. She said, there's nothing wrong with your English. She said, I can send you to someone that you would be able to use very well. So she told me to go to such and such an address and apartment, and up over the door, it said, discover yourself. Everything else has been done. Oh, I thought, really? And I went to lectures that this man gave on how to discover yourself, find out who you were, who you could be, and be it. And I did that for two years, and that was one of the most interesting things I've ever had an opportunity to do. And a lot of things you see you don't like, but you could change them. And that was just an eye-opener to me in many ways, because I was more always looking for possibilities not inadequacies. I was always thinking I was inadequate. Spent more time on that than thinking of what I could be doing. And the possibilities were enormous. And the twelfth step was this, when I went from the first step to the twelfth step because I couldn't believe I had anything that I could carry to somebody else that would help them. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, that would be wonderful for me. And I 12-stepped everybody I saw, <laughs> whether they wanted it or not. And we, in those days, we didn't all have cars and all that sort of thing. And we'd go in buses and we'd go in trolley cars and we'd go anywhere, anywhere we'd find somebody drinking and didn't want to be drinking, we would be there. And that gave me something inside of myself that I had, that I didn't know I had, that I had something I could give away. And that strengthened my equilibrium, <laughs> my ego or whatever. But oh, I felt so good when I would do that. And you know, in those days, a lot of the women were smoking and drinking in bed. And I think the first few months I got into AA, I heard of three women burning themselves up 
It was a terrible time. And then they used to use us. There was another woman was young. I mean, we were 39. That was very young. And they'd take us to hospitals, and they used to have them tell, have us tell them the stories. And then I decided, gee, it's a good thing you're not rich, because if you're rich, they can put you in a hospital, and nobody would ever find you. They got enough money to hide you. Then I realized how fortunate I was that nobody was ever rich enough to put me away. That was a good thing. So you see how you get educated in AA? You get an opportunity to view things. There would be no other way you ever could. Well, after 15 years of learning from this woman, because she was, we would eat together every night before the meeting. The meeting was 8 o'clock. And this, this woman's name was Elizabeth. And she would take me to restaurants that I wouldn't go into. They looked so shabby, but she would know the family and know that they had all kinds of good food. And they'd be down under some kind of a garage somewhere. And she taught me how to eat, because I always went to a bar where they had happy hour, and you got drinks cheap, and the food was terrible, but I didn't care. I was always drinking in joints. So I learned from her how to eat and where to eat and what to do. And all of her friends had been educated and they had families. And at Christmas time, she would always have me at big parties with these people. And that was an entirely different life than I had ever seen. And it made some impression on me. And I could see there was so much more to life than I had ever dreamed of. The possibilities that I could have. Well, then I went one time when I was drinking. I decided to go. A friend of mine was over at the Langley Field when I was trying to stop. I, I'm going backwards to tell you this. Because I said, well, the reason I'm drinking and all the friends I know drink too much. And that's the reason I'm drinking. I wouldn't be drinking like this. So I went over to Langley Field where this woman's son was in the Air Corps. And the first Saturday night I was there, they said, I went to the club, of course, the officer's club. And they said, if anything, they announced in the club, if anybody's missing a woman friend, their lady friend, She's passed out in the ladies' room. And I blamed all these people for my drinking. So to get back to where I stopped, I decided that in discovering myself, there were many things I could do. And I worked. I loved to work. That relieved me of a lot of things. I got my own business, and I got to knowing how to run a business. I had to know labor laws. I had to know a lot of things. I studied all those things. And in other words, I had a purpose. And I learned that I could be more effective if I could do and help other people do for themselves. And then I got to teaching hairdressers how to be better. I used to do beauty shows, and they'd come to see the artists work. And I said, don't come to see me work. You bring a model to me and show me what you can do. Because they had no idea how good they were. So I got an opportunity to give back to people what people gave to me. And I can tell you that when you have something to give someone, and they receive it from you, there isn't a greater satisfaction that I would ever know. And that's what I gave myself. And then later on, I decided to work on, I got concessions, and I worked on a ship. And there you learn a lot. You learn to keep your mouth shut. You never talk because you don't know who you're talking to and everybody knows the other one. And that's a very good lesson to learn. 
no gossip, no gossip. And that was a very interesting life. And I noticed that people drank on the ship more than they would drink at any other time. At nine o'clock in the morning, we'd land and, and people would start to drink. I was glad I wasn't doing that at that time. So then, after I was with this woman for 15 years, I got myself into education. And I went to college when I was 70 years old. And I graduated when I was 80. And I had to graduate. I graduated cum laude. <laughs> and that was a wonderful experience, not only for what I did, but the relationships I had to have to get there. Like algebra. Algebra knocked me out. I couldn't un- I couldn't get algebra no how. <laughs> and I had a very good friend of, a, of Elizabeth who came and sat with me and taught me algebra. Now there isn't a more loving thing you can do for anyone is is to teach them algebra. <laughs> <laughs> and I graduated cum laude, if you please. <laughs> And for to be able to do this was only because AA taught me I could change my character. And before AA, I never dreamed, never dreamed I would have anything like that. Because I didn't know that such a thing could happen. But before AA, and AA also taught me about relationships. You know, years ago, I was always ashamed of who I was, so I didn't connect very well with people. And I didn't, I didn't want them to know who I was anyhow. But through AA, I have learned the most important thing is to have good relationships. Not only with yourself, but also with yourself. But good relationships with everyone. Because that enriches your life. And the older you get, the more you need people. Just like I need AA and all of you folks. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.